Um, so welcome everyone. Recording in progress. Uh, welcome everyone. It's very nice to see so many people. I mean, of course, there wasn't really any competition. There's no other like major um, sporting events or anything. Like that. <laughs> so, so obviously you're all here to see this talk, and I'm really grateful for that. So it's um, with enormous pleasure that I get to introduce Denis Marshall, who I'm sure many of you know. Um, Denis is professor of psychology at Berkeley, and he runs um, the brain and cognitive development uh, um, units there. Um, and um, so Denis um, has for um, several decades now been at the forefront of research into human learning and development. And his work is characterized by the study of um, infant behavior, but also infant and toddler behavior. Um, but he takes a number of really quite um, special um, kind of approaches to, to studying development. Um, so first of all, his work is like unusually quantitative, I think. Um, and you know, he uses mechanistic models, including connectionist models to try to study learning and development, and I think in really, really interesting ways. Um, and also his work is characterized by being um, uh, right for translation into all kinds of real world scenarios. So uh, Denis has been one of the pioneers of what's become known as educational neuroscience. So the use of um, theories and ideas from both cognition and uh, from the brain to, in order to, to, to be translated uh, into the classroom and into to real, uh, real world applications. Um, so I think we're gonna hear a little bit about uh, all of that, all of that uh, today. Um, I'm not going to give you lots of details about Denise's kind of glittering career trajectory because the first three minutes of the talk are going to be devoted to him giving you a little bit of background about himself and uh, his, his kind of personal journey, so I won't preempt that, um, but perhaps you can all just join me in welcoming Denise here today. Well, well um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, so it's an, a real pleasure to be here. Uh, everyone says that all the time, but it's actually true. Uh, um, I was I was actually a, um, a PhD student. Um, that's going to be my next slide. So I I studied and I lived literally across the road. From here. So I lived on Walton Street. I don't think you can see there's a White House right on the corner. That's where I lived for two years. Um, but I, you know that was up many years ago. And um, I actually came back, I was looking back through my records. I came back and I gave a talk in the department about 16 years ago. So it's been a while. So stuff has changed. And I'm going to try to talk to you more about the newer stuff, or at least the stuff from the last 15 years. Um, who am I? Um, a bit of background. Uh, actually, I love the fact that I was asked to do this because I do it all the time. Because I think it kind of explains my approach to uh, the research that I do. So, um, you know, I came from this tiny little country that makes chips and chocolates that, that no one's really heard of. Um, and I grew up in lots of different countries, France, Canada, US, and, and so forth. Um, and I arrived in the UK uh, to do my undergraduate degree with absolutely no links to the UK whatsoever. Um, now, this was the 80s where it was weird for uh, you know, foreign students to come to places like Cambridge. Um, and I went to Cambridge and did natural sciences, physics, and theoretical physics. Um, and why did I do that? I don't know, it seemed like a good thing to do. It, it was a miracle that I got in. I was not, and I mean, I know people always say that, but I was really not, um, I think I was just weird. That's why they thought, hey, look, this guy's coming from France. Um, anyway, um, you know, I was good enough at physics, but I didn't have a passion for physics. What I had a passion for was, was children. Really what I wanted to do was to become a primary school teacher. Because I was good at maths, people said, don't waste your life being a teacher. You know, do something more important. And as you'll see, what I've done is finally rediscover my, I've finally re-become a primary school teacher. It just took me, I took the long, the long route around. Anyway, I ended up doing an undergraduate degree, physics and theory of physics at Cambridge. Um, and at that point, I realized that, you know, physics wasn't for me. Uh, I then went and started a PhD program at McGill in Montreal, where I uh, worked with someone called Tom Schultz, who had just discovered neural networks. And Tom Schultz was a cognitive scientist uh, interested in development, um, but very much schooled in the kind of uh, good old fashioned AI and kind of rule based production system type models, uh, and had constructed some models of reasoning with children using rule based systems, but was really frustrated by the fact that there were no good rule induction, rule learning mechanisms that would kind of mimic the way children went through their different kind of. Um, skills and capabilities and connectionism came along, neural networks came along, and it was intrinsically about learning and development and adaptation. 
So he thought, oh, this must be the solution. And look, there's this guy who's coming from Cambridge with physics. Let's get him to solve all the technical problems in the lab. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I clearly I didn't want to do that. Uh, so I left. Um, I mean, I got a master's and I went, I came here and then I started doing a defill with um, Kim Plunkett, who's just retired. Uh, I was like his first ever PhD student. Uh, and Paul Harris, um, who's still Harvard. Uh, and in those days, I was working on object permanence, kind of building um, neural network models of uh, object directed behaviors, um, perception action dissociations in babies that were loosely based on kind of dorsal ventral dissociations. So, even at that early stage, we were taking brain constraints seriously and taking, yeah, building them seriously into our information processing models of, of how learning um, took place early in development. Um, amazing, this would never happen today. And I'm not just flattering myself, but I got a lectureship before finishing my PhD, my kind of film. Um, and what I did is I lied. There's no one here. There's no one here from us. You know, they said, um, you know, well, how close are you to submitting? And I said, six weeks max. <laughs> Two years later, uh, I finally submitted my dissertation. <laughs> I had a couple of things in between that slowed me down. Um, and, uh, you know, a year after that, I moved to Birkbeck. Um, and, you know, this is just telling people what drives me. I was quite happy at Exeter, but my wife it was also an academic. There was a job in her area in university. She got shortlisted, she didn't get the job, and basically there will be nothing in this area for the next 20 years. <laughs> so we moved to London uh, with a lot more scope for kind of, um, uh, different jobs and so forth. So during this whole trajectory, what happened is I discovered <laughs> that children are more interesting than rocks. <laughs> so let's move away from physics. Um, and um, well, I can not turn up on physics or natural sciences entirely, but it is approach child development from very much of a physical scientist perspective. That is to try to identify the causal mechanisms of change. So all of my research um, is about what is causing changes in behavior, not just describing it, but causing the changes, either at a short-term, immediate time scale, longer term, or years, and so forth. And to do that, we use computational models. Um, as a way of testing our mechanism of theories. Um, I started with neural networks. I mean, I've, in the past, I did a few expert system things as well, but neural networks, I've always been a neural network person. And finally, just to finish up on my trajectory, um, when I first hit the kind of research world, I was a computational modeler, and it was, I was at the cutting edge of what was POPs. Right? And I was probably one of the kind of top kind of neural network cognitive science people in the UK. Um, but I realized that um, if you try to sell or to talk about a computational model to experimentalists, they either do this <laughs> or their eyes glaze over. Right? So um, I thought, well, I need to do some empirical work, a body of empirical work to build, build up some credibility um, so that they will then listen to me. And so I kind of redirected my research more towards experimental work um, and you know, always keeping the modeling. But in a sense, the modeling has kind of fallen by the wayside a little bit, just because there isn't enough time in the life to do everything. So I do modeling through my, my students now. Um, but the question is always the one about what are the mechanisms of change? Okay, so um, what am I going to do today? We have a limited amount of time. I've got about 30, 35 minutes to talk. Um, can't go through everything. When I was in Oxford, I was working on object permanence. Last time I came here 16 years ago, I had a whole, whole um, period of work where I was work, uh, working on kind of perceptual categorization, concept and category learning. I've done a lot of work on reason for children as well. Um, what I want to do is, is to tell you something about my post midlife crisis journey. Okay, um, So this is an academic midlife crisis where I'm sitting there, you've been doing it for 25 years or 20 years, you think I've got to have impact on the world. Okay, So how do we translate this basic science research into impactful stuff? Um, and I took one thread, which is about multi-sensory learning in which I've gone from, from some fairly basic stuff to more applied things, what happens in the classroom, to actually working with a kind of government organization to uh, run a, a intervention that will impact on children's lives. And then I've come running back because it was a scary experience. And at the very end, I hope I'll have time to talk to you, uh, do a complete gear shift you know, going from fourth to first year <laughs> sort of thing, um, where uh, I want to talk to you about some recent computational modeling work I've been doing, 
uh, with a, a student of mine called Sam Blakeman, um, in which we're trying to look at ways we can talk to our deep neural networks. How can we exchange knowledge between humans and, and neural networks in, in a meaningful way? Um, right, so let's get going. It's going to be fairly quick. It's kind of overview because each of these could be a separate talk um, and you just have to read the papers. <laughs> All right, so the first uh, area is about um, multi-sensory um, Q integration. This is some work I did with uh, Marco Nardini, who's now professor at Durham. Um, and, and really it's driven by him. And it's looking at when and how kids um, do optimal Q integration, phase optimal Q integration um, in combining sensory inputs. Um, so I think you're fairly familiar with this, but you know, we live in a multi-sensory world. Um, we take information in from all of our senses at the same time. The senses are very, sorry, have varying degrees of noise, variability associated with them, of reliability. And um, you know, we could just choose the most predictable cue to uh, base a decision, but in fact, uh, a better thing to do is to combine all the different cues, but weight those cues by their variability. Um, so basically, a cue um, with more variability will have less weight than a cue with um, less variability. Um, and there's there's plenty of evidence around that adults uh, do this kind of optimal cue integration in terms of their sensory judgments, and so we were looking at when kids started to do this. And Marco had done an initial um, uh, study with Mo Braddock and uh, Janet Atkinson, uh, suggesting that in terms of spatial cues, orientation cues, um, it didn't seem to be till about kind of 12 years of age that kids were doing this optimal cue integration stuff. Uh, Monica Gori had kind of done a replication of the, uh, the, 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 the science judgment work uh, combining haptic and visual cues as well. And again, it wasn't until 12 that kids were doing this optimal cue integration. Um, so we, uh, in this particular paper I'm going to talk about, uh, we looked at um, cues are within the same modality. So these are depth, depth perception cues. So um, they you know, you know, you, I'm sure you know there are different types of depth perception cues. There are um, binocular cues, such as binocular disparity, that will give you some information about depth, but also monocular cues, um, such as texture gradients that will all equally give you information. So uh, we were asking, you know, how many kids come and combine all these visual cues to make uh, an accurate judgment of, of uh, depth. Um, and this is, I've got a, 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 a um, picture of uh, one of our young participants who's the son of a friend of mine. And what they're doing here is um, we use kind of 3D, 3D goggles, 3D projections um, to uh, assess their performance on this task. And one of the corollaries or lessons that came out of this is that if you want kids to do, you know, psychophysics requires lots of trials. Kids hate doing the same thing over and over again, unless you put it in a video game. And they will do, and, you know, you stoke them up with stickers as well. So we don't have stickers, they'll keep doing hundreds of trials. Um, so you can get some fairly accurate kind of uh, estimates of their, their pressure discrimination pressures. So here we were uh, looking at the use of texture cues um, and uh, disparity cues for judging, uh, oh, move back a bit maybe, for judging distance. So what happened is you can't quite see it, but the child sees two different slopes, uh, which are angled at different degrees, depending on what cues you're using, and they're asked to say, well, which one is the easiest one to walk up? Okay, so in other words, the flattest one. Um, and uh, these are the kind of stimuli they had. So there were, you know, in, in some sort of cases, they, they had just disparity information. If you had your goggles on, you would see those as different um, inclinations, texture only. So you should be able to have a the impression that one of these is kind of more or it's flatter than the other one. And um, with both texture and disparity, obviously you don't have the cue, the, the goggles, so these are identical to you now. So how well did they do? Um, so uh, the, you know, the prediction of the optimal cue integration theory is that they should do better with both cues than any single cue, in, in particular better than the single best cue um, as well. Um, and if we look at the adult results first, the top, this is their, um, their detection thresholds. Um, you know, the adults are much more accurate, better when they've got both um, disparity and texture, and it's better than either the single cues. We go down the age group and we find that it's not actually below 12. They're not kind of integrating these cues in some kind of, um, as predicted by the optimal model, which is similar to the to what um, Mark would found beforehand. Um, the other thing we found here is um, uh, to what extent um, children or adults are dynamically reweighting the cues depending on the particular task. So it turns out that um, 
Just this way, this way. Oh, good. Uh, um, it turns out that texture gradients are more accurate for flatter slopes than very vertical slopes. So if you've got to make a discrimination where the, the, the two uh, slopes are pretty flat, you should be weighting texture gradients more heavily than when the slopes are pretty vertical. And that's um, exactly what happens with the adults. They weight this if they're weighting to texture cues, they weight the texture cues more in a uh, high slope is actually flatter. Sorry about that. Um, you know, the, uh, than, than the, the more vertical ones, as do the uh, 12 year olds and 10 year olds are starting to do that. And then, you know, the eight year olds aren't doing it. And this is what happens when you work with kids. You've got a little red star here. So the four year olds, for some reason, are significantly weighting them the wrong way. Okay. So we left that aside. We don't know why. But importantly, you know, it's consistent with the image that we're getting with adults uh, after 12 years of age. Okay. But, um, you know, what happens in adults is that they actually fuse the cues into a single percept, so they can't re-access the individual uh, dimensions. Um, and um, one way of assessing the extent to which those cues are actually fused or can be accessed um, individually is to have stimuli in which the cues go in uh, opposite directions. So here is a task that um, you know, was not vetted by us, but um, had been run with adults, in which uh, they had a circular displays, but same thing, texture gradients and um, binocular disparity. Uh, and the children had to make the same different types of judgments. There was a standard, and then is the other one the same or different? Okay. Uh, and uh, you know, it's easy enough with texture with, with, with um, disparity or when both are there. But when the, the key critical condition is when the texture and the disparity go in opposite directions. So if the adults, if you're an adult and you're actually fusing those together, right, you're kind of merging these in some kind of average, then you can't actually tell that it's different from the standard. Okay? Whereas if you're accessing these cues independently, each one of them is different from the standard. You can rely on one or the other, and you'd be able to detect the, the, the difference. Um, and essentially, if you look at the uh, adult uh, results um, first. This is their D prime, their detection accuracy, difference uh, detection accuracy. Um, you know, this over here is the standard finding that with two cues, they're better than any of the single cues. But when you've got them in opposite directions, they're significantly impaired as compared to individual cues. That's because they fuse them together. That's the evidence that was used for adults. And with the six year olds, we don't find that, right? So in the opposite direction thing, their performance isn't impaired. Um, so they're not actually fusing these cues together uh, like, like adults. So they're not doing, they're doing, you know, not, don't get me wrong, I'm not in any way saying that they can't access, you know, both sets of cues, they're just not fusing them into a coherence uh, per set. So um, uh, what that raises is the question of why, you know, why is it that, and so this has been replicated in lots of different tasks, that kids don't seem to be fusing or optimally combining these sensory cues. And the question is, um, you know, why, right? Why would you not do that? Is there some reason why? And I don't know for sure, okay? But one possible combination, uh, one possible reason um, in terms of anyway, uh, depth perception cues is that we forget the kids' bodies are actually uh, growing a lot. And then uh, with, with Marco, we also had a series of studies where we were looking at combining visual with uh, proprioceptive information, touching your fingers and so forth, okay? If your body is growing, then some of those dimensions, such as the proprioceptive cues, are actually quite unreliable because they're changing, especially if you're going through a kind of growth spurt. They're changing quite regularly. So you don't want to kind of you know, fuse that into your percept because it's, it's you're not exactly sure what the, the sensory input corresponds to in terms of space. Similarly with binocular disparity, if your eyes are moving apart, I'm not saying you can perceivably see the child's eyes moving apart, but as they grow, <laughs> their heads are growing, the eyes are actually, you know, the, the, the depth, the, the, the uh, angular the, the angle of the eyes corresponds to a different depth. So you don't want to be fusing that in uh, when you're still, until your body has kind of physically stabilized. So kind of constraints about the physical growth of the body are actually impacting on the kind of sensory uh, information processing. Very quickly, um, because I want to move on to some other stuff. Um, well, okay, they're not optimizing for accuracy, but what might they be, or could they potentially be optimizing for something else? Um, and the idea is uh, that we had here that, well, maybe they're actually optimizing for speed of response. So it turns out that um, the kind of CPU, the kind of processing speed of children is significantly slower than that of adults. And if you're 
you know, carrying out motor actions in a real dynamically evolving world, you need to make sure that whatever your, your computed answer is, <laughs> it occurs in time. Because if it doesn't occur in time, then things like this happen, right? It's your, your, your movements can't keep up with the world uh, and you, uh, you crash. So what we did is run a, a timed version of this kind of um, same different discrimination uh, task. Uh, in which we measured their latencies, uh, their, yeah, their reaction times, as well as their accuracy uh, for adults and six month olds, uh, six year olds, sorry. And broadly speaking, the black line is both cues uh, and you know, texture and, and uh, disparity. And what we found in the adults is of their accuracy is as usual, it's better with both cues than a single cue. Um, but in terms of latency, there's no actual benefits. The uh, speed of response for the adults is the same as the quickest. Um, Q, which happens to be texture. For the six-year-olds, which weren't integrating, what you get is a kind of accuracy response, which is either them alternating between two cues or, or, um, or averaging, but probably other, um, alternating. But you do get at some points a kind of increased speed. So it looks like they are kind of, if anything, trying to optimize the speed of response rather than the accuracy of, of response. Um, okay, so uh, this is part of the kind of doing this research in the real world in the sense that if you're doing developmental work, you need to understand that the physical body of the child is changing. And I know we all always play, or as a cognitive scientist, I, I often play lip service to, to that, but it actually has physical impact, or sorry, a real impact on the nature of the information that the children have access to and how it is um, processed. Um, and then there's this cautionary note, I, you know, optimal is very was was and is very trendy, but optimal, you know, for uh, it's not the same for a child as it is for an adult as well. So, okay, so that was a rapid run through something for about fifteen minutes. Um, I want to we're going to go increasingly more towards kind of applied stuff. Um, I want to talk now about. Uh, I'm going to let this person in. Ta da! Okay. Um, no, 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 it, but I'm glad you're interested. <laughs> That's good. Um, so uh, this is some work, uh, you know, a little snapshot of some work, a whole body of work that we did uh, funded by the ESRC with my colleague Natasha Kirkham. And it's looking at how previously we were looking at how children kind of combine, optimally combine information through the different sensory modalities, but it didn't say anything about learning. So here we're going to be looking at how multi-sensory information can be used for learning. Um, so we live in a multimodal world. And in the world of education out there, um, there was a strong um, received wisdom that enriching the um, sensory quality of stimulus would improve um, you know, learning. So for example, if you gave children with certain learning difficulties, letters that were also in 3D words so they could feel them as well as see them, it would help them identify them as um, and, and so forth. Um, and a few remedial programs were kind of based on this idea, but there was actually very little, and I still, I, I believe there's still very little good experimental work uh, looking at whether actually adding additional redundant sensory information is helpful or not. Um, and, you know, there are arguments to say that, well, maybe it just confuses them, right? It makes things worse. Um, so what we did here is explore this more systematically, and I'm going to show you two sets of results. Um, one of them is what happens when you uh, get them, give them multi sensory information, get them to learn explicitly. So, by explicitly, I mean it's an instructive task. They know they're trying to learn something versus an incidental learning task. Um, and we'll see that the effects of multi sensory information are different in these two categories of, of classes, of, of, of tasks. Okay, so um, I think I was saying earlier on to one of the, some of the students I was talking to um, that I don't do category work anymore. Actually, that's not true. What happens is this was a project on multi-sensory uh, learning, and then we had to come up with, um, okay, but we need some learning. So what task are we going to do? So oh, categorization, I've just spent 15 years doing that. Um, so these kids, this is the um, instructed learning task. Kids were given a game, games are great, they love it, uh, which are little aliens and they simply, and the aliens will appear, uh, they have visual features and auditory features, and they have to learn to recognize which spaceship the aliens go to. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, they get instant feedback as to whether they're right or wrong. Um, and we did three age groups, five, seven, 10 years, um, year two, one, one, five and one, one, three years, one, five and three. 
So, sorry, one, three, five. And the reason I'm expressing years one, three, five is those of you who work with kids, uh, it's so hard to get into schools. So these are the years they don't have exams in. <laughs> so there's no scientific reason. It's that they won't let you get anywhere near the SATS years or anything like that, but whatever. Um, and then there were three separate, it's a between subject, uh, it was a between subject design, three separate conditions, either audio only, they only get the sound, the, the uh, alien looks the same, or they only get the visual. If, uh, differences and um, you know, sound the same or they have both, but importantly, the cues are redundant, right? Um, they, they, they point to the same uh, category. So that's one of the sounds, <laughs> and, example, and that's the other family sound prototype. Um, and then I think th those are two example uh, aliens that their features that vary are number of legs, stripes, length of shape, and so forth. Okay, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, alien appeared, they had to decide which spaceship it went to and then the visual feedback is the alien would go to the spaceship that they um that was the right answer not the one they chose um and you know does having multi-century information help so the whole bunch of graphs in our in our um papers but i'll just focus on this one this is um here gosh, it looks good there it doesn't look good here we've got year years well one three and five um so five, seven, and 10 year olds. Um, and this is number of trials required to correctly uh, learn the category distinction. And it, the picture's confusing. Um, at, in the younger age groups, the green is multi-sensory, I should have said, blue is auditory, you can't read this at all, and red is, is visual, uh, information only. So for the younger kids, um, there's a benefit of multi redundant multi-sensory information compared to either of the other cues. Um, but for the older kids, it either makes no difference, or in fact, it can hinder, right? So um, if there was only auditory information, so same visual stuff, the 10-year-olds were actually quite quick at, at picking up the, the, the category distinction in this task. Um, but when you had both auditory and visual, the visual captured their attention, and they, they went as badly as they would normally do with just visual information. So having multiple sources of information um, uh, redundant sensory information wasn't necessarily helpful. It can actually be obstructive, uh, um, obstructive in learning. Okay, um, so what about, so that was an instructive task. Um, what about incidental learning? So it's, I think I and other people worked on this and there's a lot of a belief that there's a lot of incidental learning, through, a lot of incidental learning takes place in the classroom. You put up all kinds of stuff, lectures, numbers and so forth in the hopes that they would somehow absorb it by osmosis. Um, I mean, it's not the only reason, obviously, you put up children's work because they get positive feedback and encourage them and all those other things. Um, but it, it, you know, it happens in the classroom all the time. So we developed a kind of more kind of rigorous form of um, instrumental learning task. We had uh, the multi-sensory attention learning task, the MOLT task, which is um, basically a sustained attention task. Um, and I'll show you some examples um, where some animals would appear in the middle of the, of the um, middle of the screen, and they could be frogs, um, like this, with two families that were visually distinguished and were auditory distinguished. But there could be other animals as well. There were pigs, dogs, and so forth. And the kids were engaged in a task of basically catching the frog. So um, uh, it's a go no go type task. Continuous assessments. The animal appears. Whenever you saw a frog, you push the space bar and I'm sorry, that's one of the frog probes from one family. That's the other family frog probe. And um, between subject design, there were people in auditory only, visual only, or audiovisual only. Um, and yeah, uh, here's the design of the task. So animals appear. Uh, if it's a frog, you push the button, there's a net that carries it. And importantly, the net then takes it to one of two uh, locations. Exactly the same thing was happening with the aliens um, beforehand. Um, and then because it's an incidental learning task, yeah, I, I explained all this, it's an incidental learning task. After they've completed this task, you then test them on categorization of novel frogs to see whether they've picked up on these uh, this, distinctions or not. Um, and importantly, uh, main effect of age, but there's also a main effect of condition. So um, the, this is the other visual condition. You know, everyone that was in the sensory, uh, that had both auditory and visual performance did better than in either the auditory or visual. So in this case, in terms of incidental learning, having redundant uh, screens of, of sensory information actually improved um, performance. This is their uh, number of correct uh, responses on this post-test uh, uh, categorization task. Um, so here, the kind of uh, sensory, multi-sensory information was helping learning. 
And also what we did is, is a task where we had retention 24 hours later, different batch of kids, do it again, test them on the categorization task later. Um, and um, what we get, uh, audio visual is in green. Um, if you do long-term retention, actually all age groups were better um, in the multi-sensory condition than either of the single um, um, the single sensory dimensions, okay, suggesting that maybe this, that there may not have been an immediate performance improvement um, in some of the younger age groups, but a more robust uh, representation of the category was uh, developed. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at, we're at time, oh, right. Um, so <clears throat> just to summarize that, you know, as, as young as five, six years of age, kids uh, demonstrate great performance in incidental category, learning following uh, multi-sensory and sensory. Uh, and um, as I said, delayed recall 24 hours later was present, uh, was present only in the multi-century um, condition. So, I mean, it raises an interesting question about, well, why are we getting this added benefit in the uh, multi-century domains? Uh, type, sorry, why are we getting the benefit of multi-century information in the incidental learning domains, but not in the instructed learning domain? And I think, you know, the, the, the idea we have is that in the explicit uh, instruction uh, task, the kids actually engage in hypothesis testing. So they are saying, okay, there must be, you know, I, I'm supposed to figure this out. And so uh, they follow simpler hypotheses as the adults, of course, as well. And that involves focusing on a single sensory dimension. So, um, you know, oh, it's going to be the legs, and I'm ignoring the stripes and the sound and everything else. So see, that works. And then, oh, or, or they might focus on, on the auditory information world. Um, but they're doing this kind of, um, uh, hypothesis testing, filtering out the other irrelevant information, while in the incidental learning uh, task, there's no filtering going on because they're not attending to that. And so the kind of statistical regularities that occur across the different modalities can be picked up on. Um, so you're shifting their approach to learning. I mean, in some way it's obvious, but unconsciously their, their approach to how they process sensor information simply by how you present the particular task to them. Okay. Just take a kind of um, dramatic pregnant pause. So I had, um, it reminds me of a joke. One of my lecturers in, um, uh, one of my undergraduate lectures in Cambridge, actually, it was a physiology lecture, half, at half past the hour, halfway through, he always told a joke. <laughs> and um, it's not halfway through my talk, but nevertheless, um, he told a joke about um, students um, who, who had a lecturer who would always have a pot of water, a glass of water, and um, you know, drink water throughout his talk, uh, his, his lesson. And one day the students who are oh, funny decided they would replace his water with vodka. So they filled up with vodka and they all waited for him to um, you know, have a sip and um, you know, choke or whatever. And of course, he reached the moment where he drinks and he went and he drunk his water and kept on going as if nothing had happened. <laughs> Because basically, you had vodka all the time. <laughs> anyway, there we are. I remember that over 30 years later. So there must have been something, something that made it funny at the time. Okay, so this is going to be very, very short because I just don't have time to cover everything, but I'm trying to take this journey that goes more into applied. Um, so children are responding to multi sensory information differently in terms of learning depending on the kind of tasks. And so I had another line of work, which is with uh, Jessica Massoni, who just recently finished a PhD um, with Natasha Kirkham and I, and then did a postdoc with um, Julie Dockerel, UCL, um, and is now started as a lecturer at Portsmouth. Um, and she was interested in looking on the impact, at the impact of um, auditory noise, different types of auditory noise on learning in the classroom. Um, and we have a bunch of papers, but one of the ones that, um, is uh, the, the, one of the reasons I'm not focusing on this is that the picture isn't clear, it's, it's murky. But uh, one of the ones she was looking at is the impact of noise on creativity. So there is work um, out there suggesting in the creativity world that um, certain amounts of ambient noise actually improve um, creativity, improve the generation of novel ideas. So this is what's been called the Starbucks effect. I'll let you guess who funded that research. <laughs> um, and it's a Poor, the original study is quite poor, and it's in the Journal of Management Studies, but still, um, it is replicable. And um, yeah, it, it, if you have some ambient noise, 
ideals bubble up, people are less um, fixed on the particular, the less functional fixedness fixed on the particular um, line of thinking and so forth. Um, and so we were uh, looking at whether there was some evidence that this might be true um, in classrooms, um, because there is a big push. Julie Dockle's work is all about um, the bad sides of noise in, in the classroom. Um, and the, the, the murky picture that comes out of this is that maybe is the answer. <laughs> um, so it kind of depends on the child's academic level to start with and other protective factors such as their working memory and so on. Um, so, so unfortunately, it's not clear cut. It needs to be done in, in more detail. But um, the point of this whole article is to say that you know some noise and buzzing in the classroom is not necessarily a bad thing as well. Um, and then she also had another study that we look at, which is looking at look a lot of this work on the impact of noise, the negative impact of noise on academic performance, is done in well controlled environments, and that's great. Okay, except in the real world. Um, if you've got, if you're sitting there doing, um, you know, you've done some reading and you have to do a comprehension test, and there's someone with a jackhammer outside, or maybe you can hear other kids in the playground outside. In the real world, you can put in place compensatory strategies. So you can go back and reread the material. You can do all this stuff that will help support your performance. And so this is a line of work where uh, Jessica found that if you give kids the opportunity to um, apply these compensatory strategies, you find no impaired performance on kind of um, literacy and or in this is primary school, I should say, kind of literacy and uh, maths um, skills. Um, okay. So another slight change of gear. I'm not quite going from fourth to first, that's coming next. Um, so this is continuing the journey towards the applied thing. Um, you know, how does this work that we're all doing? It's really important. Um, research into the basic mechanisms, how does it impact on the real world? Um, and I wanna very briefly describe a large scale um, educational intervention that we got funded by the Wellcome Trust and by the Education Endowment Foundation, which uh, kind of tries to go down this route. We as, as cognitive scientists, cognitive neuroscientists have, you know, I was about to say hundreds of years, let's be more, uh, <laughs> let's grand and say dozens of years of, of experience of, of you know, knowing, understanding how the brain works, how the brain processes information, how people reason, and so forth. And surely this must have some applications how we deliver teaching um, in the classrooms. And so there is this field called educational neuroscience um, that uh, uh, has been around for maybe 15 years now, 15, 20 years now, where people are trying to bring in expertise from cognitive neuroscience in the classroom and work with educational practitioners um, you know, together to, to see what lessons can be learned. Um, and I'm going to talk about the unlock intervention. I, I advertise it, but um, I, there's a whole hour of lecture that I gave at some of uh, the learners lecture, um, which gives results in, in detail. So if you're really interested, go and have a look. It's on YouTube. Um, okay, but the basic idea behind this is, is to see whether uh, it came out of some neuroimaging evidence, okay, suggesting um, that, um, you know, the lay beliefs that we have, the counterintuitive beliefs that we have as a child or as an um, uneducated, quote, person, um, are still there in our heads. Those concepts are still there after we've learned the kind of proper scientific approach. Okay, so um, we all know the Earth goes around the sun, but so feels like the sun goes around the Earth, right? And if you're a bit tired, you might accidentally say to your students, the sun's going around the Earth. So they're all in there. Um, but in order to access this, um, uh, the proper scientific uh, um, conceptual representations and or to take those on, you need to kind of inhibit those pre-existing, pre-potent, um, uh, uh, counterfactual or, or misconceptions. That's where it is, misconceptions. So for example, when I'm teaching kids, uh, when you're trying to teach seven-year-olds that the earth is round, Right? I mean, it just looks flat. And I know you're the teacher, but it looks flat and they're going to go out and play football and it's going to be flat. So that gets reinforced all the time. Right? So it's in there and you need to suppress it. In, in They need to repress, not repress, suppress it in order to, to uh, uh, take that on. And there was some neuroscience evidence. So people were kind of imaging and doing studies looking at experts versus novices on scientific reasoning. And um, 
the story from that is that what differentiated um, experts from novices is that they were better, had stronger activation of functional systems in, uh, involved in inhibition, uh, semantic inhibition, uh, and this kind of tagging with the idea that they were inhibiting these ideas. So when I say to you, what do cows drink? It is not milk, of course, which every one of you has fucked <laughs> up. It's water. Um, even though I've probably done this to several of you before, it still comes out as milk, okay? So you have to suppress this. So what we did is develop a, a stop and think um, intervention. It took the format of a computer game. Um, again, it doesn't have to be computerized. There were political reasons for why we did that. Um, and kids play this computer game. And importantly, the inhibitory training is embedded within the domain that you need to apply it. So it's in, in, embedded within uh, math and science reasoning sorts of, of, of things. Um, so the program, people run, you know, uh, they run for 10 weeks. They do it three times a week during their math or science lessons. Uh, it's 12 minutes. It, they do both math and science. They get six minutes of math and six minutes of science. And it, it's a game. There's a game show. People, the, the question goes up. So, you know, um, yeah, uh, look at the needs of work. But, but math and science uh, domains that have prominent misconceptions that we know kids um, have misconceptions. And it's delivered as a whole class um, exercise. So the class does it together. It's not individualized. Um, and the teacher's up there saying, look, what do you think? You know, it's like, and I just put here for pragmatic reasons. Um, when we piloted this, we thought, well, obviously you want individualized, right? Because you want to target that, that, that people. And, and that's great. And then you hit the real world. And you go to the classroom and you say, so do you have 26 computers? And they go, what? <laughs> what is a computer? Or they go, of course, we've got 26 computers. And you find that they only have 22 that work. <laughs> um, right? So that's four kids who can't do it. Or, or you've got 26, but they're on a three-year renewal program. So, you know, a third of them are like this year, a third of them for five years ago, and a third are from 10 years ago. So just in practice, it just didn't work. Um, so, you know, our, our delivery wasn't just science-based. It was um, uh, pragmatically based. Okay. Um, tested lots of kids, 6,000 kids, 87 schools across the UK. Um, and, yeah. Uh, and it was run by an education endowment foundation. So they also called in uh, independent evaluators who tested these kids on um, academic, um, standardized academic tests. And this is their, their headline finding. Their headline finding was that uh, the program um, improved um, children's uh, math performance on standardized tests, both three and five, year three and year five, by the equivalent of two months progress. Um, and, uh, the, the science, is I'm saying this right? Oh, no, maths. So this was science by two months and maths by one month, although maths didn't quite cross that magical threshold. We had this huge discussion about P less than 0.05 and what that could possibly mean and not mean and so forth. But anyway, um, so the, the summary of this, uh, of this kind of big intervention uh, was that performance was on standardized math and science tests was uh, improved. Uh, in year three and five, two months of improvement in science affected the equivalent or one month equivalent in maths. Um, it was only based on 7.5 hours. So these are the kinds of things that we would think about practically. These are the kinds of things that schools and evaluators are really interested in. So based on 7.5 hours of input at a cost of only £5.65 per child, you get two months extra performance for £5.65. <laughs> Sounds like a good deal. Um, and, um, and of course, it was more importantly, it was effective against an active control condition in fact, the results are even better. Than the control. Um, there was a hint that it was most effective uh, for kids on um, free school meals, so more deprived children, but it was underpowered to detect those, so you can draw any conclusions. And, but there was enough of a hint that the EFIF could chucked another million and a half at running an even bigger uh, sam, um, you know, version of this uh, as well. So that's currently running with 200 schools. Um, and tune in next year to find out whether this gets replicated and like, whether it works. Um, okay, so I, I'm slightly run out of time and I've gone very quickly, um, but um, what I wanted to illustrate with this is that as you move away from the kind of optimal Q integration lab-based psychophysics to um, dealing with noise in the classroom, to dealing with, you know, people who aren't scientists, who are well-intentioned, but are involved in education policy and so forth, um, you have to throw a lot of things away. Rigor gets thrown away. 
Um, and I guess the art of doing this is trying not, try not to throw the baby out of the bathwater. So you're, you're going to compromise in lots and lots of different ways. Um, but hopefully, you know, keep enough integrity in the kind of the study, the large scale uh, real world study that, that we can draw conclusions. Um, I reassure myself the effects are fairly small there, but I reassure two months is big, but whatever, you look at effect sizes, it's pretty small. I reassure myself that so many things went wrong in the study. The fact that we've got an effect over and above all that noise, implementation noise, suggests that there is actually a kind of rigorous um, uh, me mechanism uh, at play. As well. All right, so I realized that oh, now I have to make an actual decision. So I wanted to throw in here something completely different. Um, and we've got 12 minutes left. So I'll go through this, um, but and I'll try to go through it quite quickly as an illustration, um, because I do want to leave some time for uh, questions. So and now for something completely different. Um, 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 the, the other stuff was all this thread on multi-sensory learning and so forth. Um, I also do some computational modeling. I started in that area, and recently um, I had an excellent student, Sam Blakeman, who's gone on to Sony AI. And um, we looked at various um, aspects of where we did some neural network modeling. Um, and what we have been looking at in the last year, six months, is trying to generate explanations for how deep neural networks are uh, accomplishing a task in a way that allows the network to communicate to humans and maybe humans to communicate previous experience to the network. So networks don't start out cold. They start out with knowledge that comes from um, an expert human in some way. Um, and I'm going to go way too fast so that any of you who aren't neural network people who <laughs> struggle, but I'm sorry about that. OK, so uh, why do I need explainable AI? You know, these deep networks have been very good at doing end-to-end -end type uh, problems, video games, going from pi pixels to um, to actions, um, but the problem is we just don't know exactly what decisions were made by these neural networks to solve these problems. Um, the global decision itself results from a multitude of multi uh, you know, micro decisions and micro bits of information distributed through the network. Um, so uh, it's a big thing in the AI world at the, at the moment of, of you know, trying to generate um, explainable AI. And I love this cartoon, right? We're in a philosophy department, there's a map, it's, you know, you see you are here, but why? Why am I here? Okay. And the reason I find this funny is, well, most jokes are funny because the punchlines are unexpected. And the reason this is funny is because we don't ask ourselves why most of the time about things, right? Especially action related things. Um, you know, we ask ourselves how questions, or I ask you how questions. How do you make a cake? When I ask you, you know, how do you make a cake? I want the instructions. I don't want the causal theory of, well, I put a, you know, the acid released with the right, with the baking powder creates bubbles and, and, and so forth, okay? So um, how we did something is actually useful. How the network achieved the solution is useful. Why we did something is a really complicated type of question because it requires a causal model of the world but also of your interlocutor, of who you're, who you're speaking to, what is their level of knowledge, what are they interested in? And I think that's that's really complicated. So as I said, how explanations are much more common in everyday action interaction. And that's what we were trying to do. So how do we get how type explanations out of these networks? One thing we did is look very loosely at the brain for inspiration um, and kind of leverage the, the fact that the brain is different computational systems working in parallel together, as we all know. Um, I'm amazed by people in AI, certain types of AI, who still think there's a single system that will capture cognition. Um, you know, that's not at all the way I certainly think about it. Multiple systems working together collaboratively, competitively, and so forth. In particular, there's a well-known distinction, cortical versus hippocampal. Um, the kind of complementary learning systems approach has been proposed by a number of people, McClellan, McNaughton, O'Reilly. Um, long-term learning, semantic memory, cortically based, uh, episodic memory, rapid um, short-term learning. Um, it, recently, it's been suggested that what kind of um, acts as, a, as, as a, a trigger for which of these systems is used most um, are um, reward prediction errors. So if you carry out an action um, and there's a high reward prediction error, that is likely to cause that event to be stored as a short-term, at least episodic memory. Um, so we've got 
reward prediction errors as a trigger for storing the individual flashbulb memories, and also um, some other um, features um, that have to do with episodic memory. Um, so why, you know, the, why do we have episodic memory? Um, and, you know, one theory that's been put forward um, is that actually episodic memory evolved in order to communicate to our um, conspecifics, right? So if I'm going to, if I'm going to communicate to someone, if I'm going to tell someone um, where there's good fishing, so how to get there and how to catch the fish, um, I need to remember particular episodes, key decisions of how I got there so that I can communicate them to the other, the other person who can then repeat those actions. So episodic memory is there to extract key uh, uh, moments um, in uh, a ser an action sequence that we can communicate to each other. And episodic memory, in, in reliving an episodic memory, there's evidence that we're actually replaying um, those episodes. So putting all of that together, um, oops, putting all of that together, initially what Sam did was, first of all, um, develop a complementary learning model um, of, that would help the performance of deep reinforcement learning. There was no, no explanation this at all, but what he did, this is very quick, is basically with two networks working together, one deep neural network engaged in a task, but next to it was a much smaller self-organizing map, um, which basically had limited resources and would identify um, uh, what do they call it? Not slides. Um, identify moments in the action sequence that um, uh, that the network was struggling, the, the deep network was struggling to get the right answer to select the right action for. Okay, so it's, and it could it could select up to depending on the size. Let's say what have we got here? Twenty up to twenty memories. Twenty steps in this whole sequence would be highlighted, stored with um, what the correct or a better um, action. Uh, would have been in that case than the one that the deep network had taken. So this little brother is kind of helping out the, the big brother by remembering those episodes, those moments um, where the big brother got things wrong. And putting those two things together, just initially what happens is, our, it, this was called CTDL, Complementary Temporal Difference Learning System. Very quick, it, we had different types of tasks, discrete tasks, maze tasks, you have to start here and move and get there, or continuous tasks, this is the mountain cart task where you have to control a uh, a lever that provides an impetus to this part that's going to reach a target, pointed, discrete, or continuous type tasks. In both cases, the blue, the CTDL did better than the standard neural network. So that was one thing. But this is the more interesting thing. You can then use the system to generate an explanation of what the network did. So what do you do? What you do is you take a network that's got the big brother and the little brother, right? The short term memory, and like memory, and deep action network, and you replay. Uh, uh, a particular problem, and you read off what the memories were, what the memories were in the self-organizing map um, in temporal order. And each of those is going to be at a location where it's a key point where this thing was getting it wrong, but I'm giving you what the right answer is. And so you get a sequence of, of points in space where you're given an instruction, which is a hint or a right instruction. And in fact, these, this is basically an explanation of how you get from the start point to the goal, okay? Through, um, if you follow, if someone followed the sequence. So you can get this, we did for both types of tasks. And, um, okay, we've generated these things, but are they useful? Do they work, okay? Do they help humans perform better on the task and vice versa? So if you take ones that are generated by humans and be, um, you know, seed the, the episodic memory, the song of a naive network with, locations and actions that have been identified by humans, does that help? Um, and to cut a long story short, this is, um, this is performance. I mean, these are, we just used this very simple one here. Um, this is performance, um, the amount of reward, but good is up. <laughs> performance with time, um, networks that were seeded with an explanation, they, they, they were quickest to learn get optimal, um, you know, performance, um, some shuffled explanations. So that means you've got the instructions but they're in the wrong order or nothing at all. This is a very simple problem. So even, you know, with nothing at all, the, the networks can learn this. Um, here for students, here Sam should not have done this, right? Should have noticed. The, the, the great thing between these two is that the color scheme is completely inverted. So green is with explanation here and green is no explanation here, right? So anyway, don't do that. 
Um, okay, so the networks are benefiting. What about humans? What we did is get run humans in a kind of task like this. So they're a little, you can't really see it. They had a dark screen. There's a little man with a flashlight and it lights up your little square and it tells you where you are. And you're trying, you're wandering around this maze, trying to find, starting here and trying to find the target. This is exactly the same thing. We get the humans to learn all of these things. And after they've done that, they get a blank screen and they can place flags, spatial locations with an action uh, recommendation. And these are, Obviously, we've superimposed their location and actions onto an actual grid, right? They didn't see this. They just have the black stuff. So these are the kinds of, of explanations, sequences of points and actions to take that are generated by, by humans. So qualitatively, they look very similar to what um, the machines were generating, if you look at what was generated in the song. Okay? Um, but what we did, so how do you measure them? You know, how close are they? So we tried to do some kind of... Um, Turing test type thing. We gave naive participants either human generated explanations or machine generated explanations and looked at whether they would be you know, treated equally, would be equally useful. And so this was, um, this would be, the doesn't matter what's being plotted here, points, reward, or whatever. Um, and this is um, human participants with explanations generated by humans, good, generated by machines, just as good. And this was naive, so uh, with no, no explanations at all. Okay? So the human and the machine explanations were just as good at improving um, the participants' um, performance on, on, the, on this maze that they hadn't seen before. And you might ask, what is this? You shouldn't do this, informal talks. This is us having screwed up a condition. Um, we were shuffling the explanations, but there was a bug in the code. And the shuffled one was about 70% the same as the machine generated one. So it's like, I could be doing so well on the shuffled one. So anyway, um, so that's it. I, I, I wanted to do that as a separate side thing. It's just to show that I don't just work with cute kids and do you know, projects in school. Um, we're trying to, um, you know, yeah. Also understand, well, understand the mechanisms of learning, which is all sharing information across systems, across machines and human teams, machines and so forth, um, as well as across humans and humans. Okay, that's it. So I've got one minute for questions. No, <laughs> um, just to say, I'm gonna use up my one minute by saying the future. Um, so the future, uh, for those who don't know, some of you do know, we recently opened a new lab at Birkbeck. We're very lucky. We've got a, a toddler lab and this is a four story building. Uh, each floor has got a different lab, which is configured to be a real world type environment. So a preschool environment, a home environment. We have a K virtual immersive virtual reality sort of thing. Um, but importantly, these labs um, are also kitted out with uh, wireless and wearable technology. So we can kind of record EG and F mirrors while kids are interacting in these spaces, interacting with each other in these spaces. We have motion tracking cameras around as well. Um, and the idea is to move all this research that we've been doing in, in more sterile lab environments to much more real world environments where strategies such as the compensatory strategies we were talking about in school can appear and relying on others, you know, much of this cognitive testing happens in isolation. But you look at babies, um, for example, in kind of object permanence, expectation violation tasks, they often look back for confirmation from the parents. And we've got like blinders on the parents so they can't help. But that's just not natural. It's not you know, consistent with the strategies that they have developed in the real world. So we're in a sense hindering them um, from showing the kind of learning abilities that they've got. Um, and at this point, I'll say thank you very much. For so we have 30 seconds for questions. <laughs> I can say rather longer people want to chat, but I also understand you want to watch the second half of football. Yeah. Yeah. I understand some people may have to leave. Yeah, and we work feel shy. Work. Um, but if you're able to stay for a few minutes, I'm sure we can ask questions starting with Gaia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, why is it important? It's not necessary that you need it, but in many co complex problems, you can get yourself into um, uh, solutions that are not optimal, but they'll, they'll, they'll get you 80% of the way, but in fact, they'll stop you from getting the other 20%, right? So you've got a kind of local minimum. Um, and 
it's very hard for kind of um, error minimization type algorithms to escape from those local minima. So what this does is if it's, if it's doing something consistently wrong, it gives it an escape route, right? So the, uh, sorry, let me just show this one. So the actual solution, you know, the, 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 um, the action selected by the, the system as a whole is a blend of the um, predicted, the action predicted by the big brother, by the neural network, um, and the action predicted by this kind of little brother who's got a special lookup table, as it were, of these key moments. Okay? So it allows you, and it's weighted towards the ones where there's often um, reward prediction error, it, it weights it to listen to this side rather than that side. Um, it, uh, I think I've got, have I got it here? Yes. Oh, oh. Somebody, um, I, it's been cut at the bottom. Um, now I can't remember the name. Someone really famous, uh, um, not Plout, but um, anyway, somebody really famous uh, um, and his PhD student um, proposed a very similar solution um, in ticks. But basically, what they did is instead of having a kind of map that learns which problems, they had a um, a lookup table. So it's a cheat sheet, and so this is doing really well. But on a few occasions, it's not doing well. So you look it up, and that's fine for AI um, because you can do that. It's just not of a way I think that's consistent with how humans do it. Did that kind of answer your question? Or? Yeah, yes. I was I was wondering about the reason I was asking, but I was wondering to what extent um that look at people that the cheat yeah. sheet is internal or can it sometimes be external and that might that in fact be more than just some of the supportive sure. intelligence that can occur between people learn. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So uh sure. So once you've got a cheat sheet, if it's external, it could be modeling anything. It could be the teacher, it could be the parent, it could be a peer, it could be anything else. Here, you know, I'm, I'm trying to model this um, as an internal thing. But importantly, well, I don't have the right figure, you know, communication, you imagine you've got another one of these guys here who's solved this problem already. What you do to provide the explanations is you take the representations here and you just copy them into there. So you're transferring the knowledge um, to there. Or similarly, if adults, um, adults, humans, we have explanations that are generated by humans we simply, you know, in color code whatever the path was the humans had directly there. So we're using the episodic memory as a way of transferring information. Well, not all information, because you never communicate all information, just what are perceived to be the critical bits of information, the critical decisions in this kind of action trajectory uh, to allow an individual to solve the problem. More questions? Yes. Oh, well, they're interested actually in the question about how noise influences children's performance. And I was wondering if there are any significant individual differences, especially as in um, adult individual differences in search on personality traits. It's often been found that people who are high in extroversion. Um, perform um, perform better under conditions of moderate noise, while those who are high in introvert perform better under conditions yeah. of silence. Yep. Yeah. So that's an excellent question. So you can't see it, but the title here is "Individual Differences in Dealing with Noise Disturbances." So it's clearly you know what we were interested in. Um, the answer is yes. There are individual differences here. We were looking at it, or Jessica was looking at it in terms of individual differences in executive function skills. Um, she has another paper that has recently come out two months ago, which looks at personality traits. Um, and if I could remember for the you know, what the result was, I would be able to answer your question. But absolutely, it's, it's completely worth it. Yeah. And then, of course, these are all children. And some of the previous work you mentioned is in adults. So, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Kate, what's next? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. And like I was interested in the the part of it you're talking thinking about um episodic memory in terms of replaying and having a social communication context and future thinking and all that sort of thing. So it sounds pretty much like syntax. It doesn't sound like syntax to me at all, but let's but pull that up. In, in terms of how we navigate this in, I don't mean literally in talking, but yep. how we represent bench structure. There's a whole literature of things like linguistics about a lot of syntax in thinking about the past reflecting on the future, making predictions and so on. So I just wonder how this interfaces with the sort of language system. So I guess um, 
I'll admit that I haven't thought about a syntax at all because I syntax to me means some kind of system in the Systematicity. Systematicity, yes. Yeah. In the kind of the way we manipulate representations. Mm -hmm. And that's not a trait of these types of networks, as I'm sure you know. Um, I mean, language, okay. Um, so we haven't put any language into this. Mm -hmm. um, I have my own personal pet theory that the language is not a property of the mind, it's, it's the tool we use to communicate. So um, I'm sure language will play a role in how one agent will communicate the information to the other agents. Um, but I'm not sure that the representations of the information is represented in any kind of uh, linguistic format. So it's not quite what you would think. But, well, I, think uh, I think you could flip it and argue it the other way. Possibly. It's an empirical question. How's that to say? I mean, I, I really, it's, it's a great question, but it's really not something I thought about in terms of I just don't see the immediate link with, with any kind of syntax type. Um, system. So yeah, because the, the component map is, is doing a nearest neighbor search, right? So it's but it's a thought search. I mean, and then it's not given by any systematic structure. No, exactly. But it's structured. Well, quite. Because the syntax falls out of these. I don't mean to make quite too above, right? Well, I don't want to. The genes. Got you. Yeah, I'll give you genes. Yeah, I mean, there's there's something there's sure. some yeah, representational bias from the outset, but the structure that falls out of learning. Is, is syntax, and then that is applied in the context of replaying a yeah. replaying an episode. Certainly, I guess I would have to. I mean, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I'd have to have a better understanding of what you mean by syntax because yeah. I might have. Well, I think also, obviously it's a consequence of learning in a complex environment yeah. rather than something that naturally is there at the outset. It's the emergent property of experience yeah. within the system. Well, that so far I totally agree with emerging property <laughs> and the system by by that that's not the way I've heard it used in the past, but I just reflect. Okay, we'll call it communication if you okay, want. I like that. I'll do communication outside. Communication in humans yeah. is not acceptable from Interesting. My teenager's grunt a lot. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I'm so glad that we have real uh, environmental seminars. It's a sign of a healthy and selectively vibrant department. Um, we, um, I think, probably should only take one more question because I know people need to get on. What was the I was interested in the first part actually about um, the children's implicit, like the, the balancing of the cues and the fact that you've got this, the true integration. Yeah. Specifically, when they did uh, implicit learning, um, so I'm interested in how that relates to what adults do. Um, I mean, I, I guess some kind of blocking is going on when they're in the explicit, when they focus on one cue and that's somehow blocking the learning of the other. Is that I don't know. So that's a good question. We haven't followed this up yeah. uh, in that, but um, I, I, there's no blocking on our part, right? But I think from them, yes, that's exactly the way I would conceptualize yeah. it. Yeah. That they are. They're doing hypothesis testing. They are what I would call filtering the other possibilities. So you think, oh, I think it's the number of legs, right? And then you try it for a bit until evidence just has to Well, or it doesn't work, but the point is you're doing one at a yeah. time and you yeah. probably focus in on, I mean, it only takes them about 60 trials to learn this, right? So um, there aren't a huge number of, of trials. If you're going to block out, say, auditory information yeah. for at least half of those, that really reduces the amount of time you have. So, maybe that relates to, so I'm trying to match that with what you said with adults. So, adults seem to be doing the cue integration even in the explicit tasks, right? right? And that's, yeah. yeah. So, that interests me because you think that. Right. Yeah. So, there's a slight um, miscommunication on my part. So, the first part is about sensory cue integration, okay. not necessarily about learning, right? So, <laughs> The second part is about learning. How do you combine these cues to learn something, right? There's absolutely no learning. Um, there should be no learning in the cue integration things. There's probably some perceptual tuning to at the beginning. Um, you like tuning into what, what, what are the- There's been learning in the past to get to that. Yeah, there has been learning in the past, you're right. So, yeah. um, so you don't know on the prompt task what adults would do then? No, uh, I'm sure someone's done that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I don't know. I mean, just because you'd expect that adults to be doing it quite explicitly. But so then well, they say maybe wouldn't, but maybe, but maybe because of their greater capacity, they yeah. would be able to do it explicitly. I don't know the answer. Yeah. 
I mean, I think the other thing to think about is the ages, how the ages line up here. Okay, so, um, or maybe I'm getting myself mixed up here. Um, you know, the Q integration stuff, the, um, the Q integration stuff doesn't happen until about 10 to 12. Optimal optimal, so optimal Q integration, Bayes optimal, very specific, um, doesn't happen until about 10, 12 years above. The kind of learning stuff we had was all younger than that. The oldest kids were 10. So you're still getting, you know, the, the incidental, maybe I've got myself confused here, the incidental learning dimension of it and the explicit, what we think is hypothesis testing happening below the age when you're showing this kind of optimal Q integration in, in the century. Does that answer your question a little bit or have I completely gone yeah. off? Um, okay. I think it's hard to put the two results together, right? Yeah. Well, one, exactly. So, so, and then they're really interesting. Correct. I, that's right. Yeah. So, I mean, one, like, yeah, one is learning. And the other thing to, you know, keep in mind is when, when we say there's no optimal base optimal Q integration until 10, it does not mean that kids are not combining visual and auditory information until they're 10, right? I mean, you know, you, you, the first time you try to take a step or visual and proprioceptive, first time you take a step, if you weren't combining, you'd fall over a meat. So they're clearly doing it, they're just not doing it in this kind of base optimal way um, or accuracy um, until you know, quite a bit uh, later. Super. All right. Shall we leave it there? Let's have yep. a